Hello everyone, thank you for attending uh, our uh, innovative discovery series after a long summer. So we are absolutely delighted today to have one of our own, Madeline Brooks from the Institute for Research in Equity and Community Health or IRICH at Christiana Care, giving us a talk about her work on COVID-19 testing. But before I introduce her, let me mention some housekeeping issues. So we will uh, extend CME credits for our tech talks and our ID series presentations. We can distribute the information via email to those that registered to the, for today's event. But if you haven't registered yet, you can still obtain CME code information from Lisa and I will, uh, uh, I will write her email address in, uh, in the chat. Our October 28th ID series uh, is uh, Christine Brown from Christiana Care, who will talk about getting started with Stitch Back, and October is Health Literacy Month, so that will be really um, the, the, a really great lecture to, uh, to attend here. And then October 7th, we have a Tech Talk, uh, Dr. Kalnia Kniel from University of Delaware, We'll talk about wastewater and pathogens using the past to inform the future. So this is also going to be fascinating. So do not miss our October 7th tech talk. So again, I'm really delighted to introduce Madi today. Uh, Madi is cu uh, currently a research investigator in IRICH at Christiana Care, where she works on the application of mixed methods and spe spatial analysis to improve population health. She obtained an MPH in public health practice from Thomas Jefferson University in 2018 and a certificate in spatial analysis for public health from Johns Hopkins in 2019. And really, Maddie here is our geospatial expert uh, in IRICH, in our team. She's new in her career, research career, but already has a long list of publications, has been a guest lecturer on the use of geographic information systems for public health and health services research at Johns Hopkins, Thomas Jefferson, and University of Delaware. And I wish I was, I had attended this lecture, Maddie. And she's also a mentor for ingress summer students and graduate public health students. So thank you so much, Maddie, and we look forward to, uh, to your presentation. Thank you, Claudine, that was very kind. I'll share my slides now. Lisa, can you see my slides okay? Yes, everything looks good. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for that introdu introduction and for the chance to speak to you today. Um, it's really exciting to get the chance to speak to this network about our spatial analysis of COVID-19 testing that we conducted with the Newcastle County government and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So I'll start with an overview of my presentation for this afternoon. I'd like to speak to you about using geographic information systems or GIS for COVID-19 response. And I'll speak more about how we use GIS to develop a testing strategy in Newcastle County, Delaware. I'll also cover some supplemental analyses that we performed as well as learnings, limitations and future directions from this work. There are a few learning objectives that I'd like to leave with you today. And the first is the ability to describe the use of GIS for public health preparedness, including infectious disease outbreaks. I'll also demonstrate how we can use testing and sociodemographic data to track disease spread and promote equitable resource allocation. And finally, I'll review a few key broad lessons for public-private partnerships that are providing community-based health services, like the provision of testing. I wanted to start this presentation by giving a thank you to uh, all of the people who supported this work because it was a true team effort. Uh, the people listed here helped to develop, develop this partnership with the Newcastle County government, think about the analysis strategies and interpretation of results and extract data on a regular basis to support these efforts. Um, so a huge thank you goes out to everyone here. Now I'll speak more about how uh, GIS has been used more broadly for COVID-19 response. So it helps us start with a definition of a geographic information system. And it's a computer-based system used to create, store, map, and analyze spatial data. In its simplest form, you can think of it as a spatial database. So when you're thinking about a map, 
you might have different layers that you want to represent. You might have point locations that are representing disease cases, and you might have other data representing street networks or neighborhood boundaries. And a GIS allows you to combine all of these layers, not only to map them, uh, but to analyze them. So I wanted to take a minute and just ask you to close your eyes and think about examples where you've seen maps used to inform COVID-19 response. Now I'm guessing that for many of you, the first example that you might think of is the Johns Hopkins uh, COVID-19 mapping dashboard, which has become a tremendous resource worldwide for tracking the spread of COVID. Others of you may have thought of the maps that are published by the New York Times every day. So when you go to check your uh, morning news on your app, you'll see the US maps of hotspots and vaccination rates across the country. And then thinking more locally, the Delaware Division of Public Health has an excellent COVID dashboard where they publish zip code level maps of testing positivity and vaccination rates that are updated on a regular basis. So we can see trends in our home state. And these examples, while they're pretty prominent, are just a few ways that GIS has been used in COVID-19 applications. Um, there's been a number of uses, including disease surveillance of COVID itself, contact tracing, resource allocation, and communicating the effects and the spread of COVID to a variety of stakeholders, from lay people to government officials. And it helps to step back and think about why geography? Why are we using maps as a lens to examine uh, public health issues and infectious disease in particular? And infectious diseases are inherently spatial. They spread from person to person and place to place, which is what we've seen with the worldwide spread of COVID-19. And we also know that the risk factors for COVID-19, like greater prevalence of older age, chronic conditions, poverty, crowded housing, and more, they vary across the map and they generate according spatial variation in disease. And unfortunately, we have seen that COVID-19 morbidity and mortality do follow patterns of racial and economic segregation across the US, which are mirroring longstanding disparities in other diseases. And for all these reasons, geography is a really efficient lens for tracking not only disease, but also its social and environmental correlates. I wanted to highlight this report that was published by the Brookings Institute uh, in May of last year. It was, it was one of the earliest examples to look at neighborhood differences in social distancing. And specifically, they used cell phone data to look at uh, social distancing and the spread of COVID in black and white neighborhoods in Detroit. And it includes this line, differentiated economic circumstances and race have further cleaved Detroit into two halves those who can comply with social distancing ordinances and those whose race and economic situation dictate otherwise. And I bring this up because your neighborhood conditions, um, your employment, your housing, all of these dictate your ability to social distance and protect yourself from COVID-19. So there are pronounced uh, place-based and neighborhood-based differences in the, the ability to protect ourselves from COVID-19 and that can generate according disparities in the burden of this disease. As we think about the ability to protect ourselves from the spread of COVID and protect others, uh, testing is one of the most crucial resources we have. And there are several factors that can impact access to testing. The first being the locations themselves, uh, where they are and whether they're accessible uh, via different types of transportation. We can also think about the cultural and language considerations of these testing sites to make sure that they can accommodate different populations based on their linguistic and cultural needs. And then thinking back very early in the pandemic, March, April, May of last year, testing was still a pretty scarce resource and was rationed on the basis of different screening criteria, like recent travel or cardinal symptoms. And now with that background in mind, I'll share how we use GIS to develop a testing site strategy with the county. For those of you who aren't local to Delaware, Newcastle County is one of three counties in Delaware, and it's the northernmost county, about halfway between Philadelphia and Baltimore. Um, and despite being one of three counties, we actually contain about two thirds of the state's population. Newcastle County is also home to the city of Wilmington, which is Delaware's most popular city and it's considered an industrial legacy city that's characterized by high poverty rates and a large black population. 
And that context is relevant to some of the trends that we'll observe later. And to situate Christiana Care within Newcastle County, uh, our system does provide about 88% of the county's adult non-veteran acute care. So back in spring of last year, the Newcastle County government received funding from the CARES Act, which enabled it to quadruple its testing capacity. And they came to us and asked us to help them select roughly 30 additional communities for testing resources. So our goal was to prioritize county census tracts for test site placement to ensure that we're making judicious and equitable use of testing resources. And I just mentioned census tracts, which might be a new term for some of you. And census tracts are just relatively small geographic units with stable boundaries, and they're used to report population statistics over time. Uh, so you can think of these roughly as neighborhood units. So we developed an initial approach to prioritize census tracts for testing based on testing rates, positivity rates, and other population level social risk factors for COVID-19 transmission. And over time, we use data from the testing sites that were administered by Newcastle County. And we also supplemented that with some data um, from Christiana Care testing, since we are providing a great deal of testing within the county. So once we had these records of tested people, we had to perform a few tasks in a GIS to analyze these data. So for every test record, there was a home address associated with that record. And we would geocode them, which just means that we're transforming their home address into a set of longitude or latitude coordinates so we can plot them as a dot on a map. And once we did that, we could use a join by spatial location to aggregate those test records to census tracts, which you see on the map to your right. And once we had those data at the track level, we could calculate testing rates or the number of tests per 1,000 adult population and positivity rates or the percent of positive test results. We also wanted to incorporate other uh, socioeconomic and demographic risk factors that as of late spring last year, we knew were associated with COVID-19 transmission. And we used a variety of data sources from the US Census Bureau and from the CDC. First, we knew at this time that there were pronounced uh, racial and socioeconomic disparities in COVID transmission, um, mainly that the burden of COVID was felt more strongly in communities of color and those with low, lower socioeconomic status. So we considered the percentage of racial or ethnic minority population, as well as a measure of socioeconomic status vulnerability from the CDC. We also chose to incorporate the percentage of people employed in service occupations as well as the percentage of households that are considered to be crowded, because those two factors we assumed were associated with limited ability to social distance. So we looked at those four variables and we looked at their track level distributions across Newcastle County. And we used those values to assign scores of high, moderate, or low risk. And we also wanted to apply some weighting to the social risk score. Um, we really wanted to take a strong pro-equity approach here and make sure that we're prioritizing the populations that um, have historically faced disparities in COVID and in other disease conditions. So we applied extra weight by flagging census tracts that had both a high racial ethnic minority population and high socioeconomic vulnerability within the county. And this final score ranged from zero to 11 with higher scores indicating higher social risk for COVID transmission. And you can see a map of those scores to your right with the darker shades of red corresponding to areas with greater social risk. And you can see that the greater levels of social risk are concentrated in the greater Wilmington area, extending downward through Newport and Newcastle. So our approach for prioritizing census tracts was to review the distribution of positivity rates and social risk factor scores and we flagged tracks that were above a sufficiently high cutoff point for each measure based on the distribution of positivity scores at that point in time. And then we would take those tracks and rank order them from the lowest to highest testing rates and select the top 20 or 30 to tell the county to prioritize for additional uh, testing resources. Now, our first analysis was to inform the initial placement of community-based testing sites. And there were no data from these sites available yet. 
So we started by using data from adult county residents who received testing from Christiana Care between March and May of 2020. And then later, as we did get data from those community-based testing sites run by the county, we used that for our analysis in addition to data from people tested through Christiana Care. This was one of the very first maps that we created to prioritize areas within Newcastle County for additional testing resources. So over the next year, we use this approach to recommend communities for test site placement roughly every four to eight weeks. And we also wanted to examine positivity rates by race and ethnicity that were age adjusted. And we conducted a number of supplemental analyses in response to specific questions that the county presented to us. And we provided them with a number of different uh, reports and maps to help them inform their test site strategy. And now I'll get into summarizing the past year of trends that we observed from these data. Um, and everything coming up is based on data from Newcastle County adults who received testing at only the community-based sites run by the county. But first, we'll look at the testing sites themselves. Um, there was a large number of testing sites, excuse me, that were operated by the county from May uh, 2020 to May of 2021. 2021. And 23 of them were walk-up sites, um, which really exemplifies the county's commitment to addressing any possible transportation-based barriers. And you can see those walk-up sites and red dots on the map. And it also um, is a great reflection on the county that they offered testing at a variety of different locations um, that were familiar in the community and where people would feel comfortable receiving testing. And these included schools, parks, houses of worship, community centers, and more. And over the past year, there were more than 570,000 tested um, tests that were administered to county residents. Um, and a large share of these, about 81%, were administered to adults. The first set of maps that you see here are testing levels for tests per 1,000 adults at the census tract level, which are divided by quarters over the past year. So where you see darker shades of red and orange correspond to areas that had higher levels of testing. And you can see over time, the testing levels, they tended to be relatively higher in that northern edge of Newcastle County which corresponds to Northern Newark, Pike Creek, Cocessin, York Glen, and parts of North Wilmington. If you look at the smaller inset map, that outlines the city of Wilmington. And you can see that during quarters one and two of the past year, testing rates were relatively low in the city, um, but they steadily grew higher during quarters three and four. And by quarter four, uh, March through May of this year, testing levels were more homogenous across Newcastle County. And these sets of maps you see here are positivity rates at the census tract level or the percentage of positive test results. And the darker shades on the map correspond to areas with higher positivity rates, which indicates areas where we are perhaps not doing enough testing to control the spread of COVID. And you can see over time that higher positivity rates are generally concentrated in the northeastern edge of Newcastle County, extending from Southern Newark up through the city of Wilmington. And it's a little easier to look at these maps side by side to compare these trends. And where you see there are lower testing rates, areas in lighter shades on the top set of maps, there tend to be higher positivity rates in those areas on the bottom set of maps. And that's exactly what we expect because the positivity rates are a function of testing. Um, as we do more testing, we would expect positivity rates to be driven down because we're testing more people who likely don't have COVID. Um, so these maps of testing and positivity rates are always going to look like the inverse of each other. And the takeaway from comparing these maps side by side is that um, these spatial trends were pretty consistent throughout the past year in that testing levels tended to be higher um, in the northern edge of Newcastle County, which tends to be more affluent, while higher positivity rates and insufficient testing were generally concentrated in the northeastern uh, edge of Newcastle County. Also take a minute to look at testing rates by race and ethnicity over the past year. And the main takeaway here is that testing rates uh, were highest among non-Hispanic black adult residents within the county, followed by Hispanic and Latino residents. 
And that story is a little different when we consider positivity rates, which are stratified by race and ethnicity and also adjusted for age. And we saw that Hispanic and Latino adult residents had disparately high positivity rates, often two to three times higher than that of their non-Hispanic white counterparts. And that was a little surprising given that they did as a group have some of the higher testing rates over the past year. Now I'll cover some supplemental analyses that we've conducted over the past several months. First, the Delaware Division of Public Health actually developed its own prioritization method for census tracts. And they base their measure on the percentage of population tested, percentage of tested people with a positive test result, and their case rate or cases per 1,000 people. And the Division of Public Health had access to person level data for all adults and children from all testing sources in Delaware. So they were working with a more complete data source than they had, than we had. And they divided their measures into tertiles of low, medium, or high priority. So we wanted to conduct some analyses to see where the Division of Public Health and iReach methods might differ based on the data sources that were available to us. So we applied the Delaware Division of Public Health method using the available testing data that we had from Newcastle County and from Christiana Care. And we calculated the inter-rater reliability or percent agreement between these measures calculated by iReach and DPH and mapped these side by side. And you can see those maps here. So we compared the percent tested, the percent positive, and the case rates by census tract across Newcastle County. And in each set of maps, the left side map corresponds to the data that was available to the Division of Public Health. And the right side map corresponds to the data that we had available from the county testing sites and from Christiana Care. And we found that the inter-rater reliability for all of these measures was moderate in Newcastle County outside of Wilmington, ranging um, from about 60 to 68% agreement and higher within the city of Wilmington ranging from about 58 to 75% agreement. And that might suggest that the county and Christiana Care were accounting for a larger share of testing within the city of Wilmington. So our data was coming closer to the, the ground source of truth or all available testing data within the city. And looking at these maps side by side, they're relatively similar in terms of identifying areas of high priority. So we felt pretty confident that despite the differences in method or data sources, we are generally identifying the same areas of priority um, as the Division of Public Health was. We also had some initial questions about uh, where the people tested at a given site came from. We wanted to see the distribution of people who traveled to a particular site to get tested. And here we used a spatial statistical technique called kernel density estimation to visualize the spatial point level distribution of people tested at a given site. So the distribution of red is people who were tested at that site represented by the white star. And you can see that the people tested at a given site are coming from a fairly broad geographic range outside of the immediate neighborhood or census tract in which these sites were located. And the message here is that testing may be accessed by people outside of the immediate communities in which sites were located. The county also asked us to look at their walk-up sites to see if they were generally accessible. So one of the first things we did was to use a walkability index developed by the EPA, um, which is calculated at the census block group level. And on this right side map, the areas that you see in darker shades of green are generally considered to be more walkable based on measures of street network density, land use, and crosswalks. And you can see here that the majority of the county's testing sites, their walk-up testing sites, were located in areas that were considered to be highly walkable. We also looked at the percentage of people tested at each of these sites during a given time frame who lived within a one mile radius of that test site, just to get a general sense of whether um, they live generally close and were able to access these sites within a short walking distance. And it was a little surprising to see that overall, only about 15% of people tested at these walk-up sites uh, came from within a one mile radius where these sites were located. 
And we also had other questions about the provision of community-based testing that were specific to testing provided by Christiana Care. Back in April of last year, Christiana Care partnered with the Kingswood Community Center and the Latin American Community Center to expand testing access in underserved Wilmington neighborhoods. Um, and the Latin American Community Center is represented by the White Star, while Kingswood Community Center is represented by the Yellow Star. And these were located in neighborhoods highlighted in dark red, uh, which corresponded to a high priority ranking based on our method. So we had a general question about how to increase testing uptake at these centers among local residents. So we worked with our data analysts to uh, pull records for people who were tested at either site between April 4th and December 1st of last year. And there were an estimated 1,000 residents, most of whom were adults that received testing at these sites within that time frame. And during this time frame, there was an overall positivity rate of 16%, uh, which is much higher than we would like to see above a, a recommended positivity rate of 5% or lower. And over time, we found that these testing levels were pretty steady throughout the summer, but spiked immediately before the Thanksgiving holiday, likely as people were meeting with family. We also found it interesting to see that less than half of the tested adults at these sites lived within the city of Wilmington, and only 30% or so of these tested adults came from Kingswood or Latin American community centers surrounding neighborhoods. We also wanted to look at the demographic characteristics of adults tested at these sites compared to the characteristics of the adult population around these sites to see are tested adults generally representative of the population we're trying to reach. And we define the surrounding adult population as those who live within the census tract in which these centers are located, as well as the neighboring census tracts around that. And we use data from the U.S. Census Bureau's American Community Survey uh, to characterize the general adult population. First, looking at their age distribution, uh, the adults tested at Kingswood or Latin American Community Center were generally pretty representative of the broader community in terms of their age, though we did have a smaller share of adults over age 65 tested at these locations. Well, the black population around Kingswood and Latin American community uh, centers was 60% black. Um, only 40% of adults tested at these sites were black. And conversely, about 12% of the adult population around these sites were Hispanic or Latinx, um, whereas about 21% of our sample was Hispanic or Latinx. And this might suggest that um, we were unable to reach as much of the black population, particularly around the Kingswood Community Center, as we would have liked to, um, but we did seem to do a better job of reaching the Hispanic and Latinx adult population through the Latin American Community Center. And now I'll conclude my presentation with some more uh, summary of these findings, as well as learnings and future directions for this work. First, we observed that Hispanic residents experienced disparately high positivity rates over the past year, despite having higher levels of testing. And that was surprising because we would expect higher testing rates would really drive down those positivity rates. Um, and this showed us that even though Hispanic adults had some of the highest testing rates, even that level of testing was not sufficient uh, to control the spread of COVID-19 effectively among the Hispanic adult community. So testing rates alone cannot verify if testing is sufficient to meet the needs of different populations. And then some of our other supplemental analyses, um, looking at the distribution of social risk, looking at walkability, looking at the distribution of tested people relative to the site that they attended, we saw that a disproportionate amount of testing was accessed by residents of more affluent regions that exhibited lower levels of disease spread. So this strategy of placing test sites in high-risk regions did not ensure that testing was equally accessed by residents of the target communities. There are a number of limitations that I want to mention for this work. First being that we had incomplete testing data. We didn't have testing that was provided by um, other healthcare providers in the county. So our testing and positivity rates are not a true snapshot of uh, the entire county. 
though we do feel like they are pretty representative because we are capturing um, a great deal of countywide testing. Also, our data included testing that was administered at nursing homes, which may reflect testing not available to the general public. And then there was also a relatively large percent of these records that lacked race and ethnicity information, about 16%. We don't know how much of that is due to adults choosing not to report their race or ethnicity, or this information not being collected at the time of testing. And finally, we didn't have information on testing site hours, days of operation, advertising capacity, other contextual factors that um, might explain differences in testing across sites. So thinking about future directions for this work, um, I believe that this project was very relevant to other efforts to provide community site-based health services like vaccination clinics or preventive health screenings. One of the main lessons from this work is that we should not rely solely on a geographic strategy to ensure access. Um, the geographic strategy was necessary but not sufficient to ensure that we're meeting the populations that we hope to meet. And in addition, we also need to think about other barriers to testing beyond physical location or uh, access to transportation at these test sites. We also need to think about work schedules, childcare needs, public transportation accessibility, and any linguistic or cultural barriers that may have made it difficult to obtain testing. And to that point, qualitative and community-engaged re research methods are really critical to identify and address these other barriers. So in conclusion, I think this work really shows the value of public-private partnerships to com improve community health. Specifically, it was really rewarding for us within iReach to share our research expertise to inform direct service provision to county residents and serve the population outside the walls of our hospital. And there were a couple elements that made this partnership with the Newcastle County government work so well. We had flexible data sharing agreements, we also had shared expectations around goals and reporting timelines. And we had regular monitoring, uh, generating these regular reports to ensure that we're meeting our goals and can adjust our strategy as necessary. So in conclusion, I hope that this demonstrates the value of GIS uh, for thinking about public health preparedness and the ways in which we can learn from this work to support future public-private partnerships. Uh, thank you everyone for your time and Please feel free to contact me with any additional questions. And I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mali, for this wonderful presentation and, and really uh, all this evidence of how helpful you know you were for, for the county. Any questions for Mali? Maddie, great presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. I was wondering if if you want to look back and if you want to redo this work, like do something differently, is there something that you would change? Somebody who has been working on this for a long time. I would definitely include more of the qualitative and community-based research methods up front. Um, I think it would have been great to just do some informal interviews or surveys with people who were at these testing sites to understand what made it possible or comfortable for them to be at these sites, what would make it easier in the future, um, and connecting them to other potential resources at the time of testing, if they um, did need a safe place to socially distance, if they were sick and couldn't go back home to their family, um, if they needed other kinds of social supports, um, being able to connect those at the time of testing, um, I think that would have been very valuable. Maddie, excellent presentation, um, and obviously, you know, amazing work. I, I applaud the, the effort that you've done over the, the past year and a half. Um, two questions, I guess. So first, in thinking about the, the data and the data that you initially had available and then the data that, you know, became available later on, um, can you identify some data sources that you wish you had um, but didn't? Um, and just talk a little bit about the process of, of getting that information. You know, there's a lot of people who are talking 
about transparency and openness and sharing data and, and how COVID really um, has pushed us a little bit in, in moving forward with respect to policies and how to share data, but there's still still a lot of barriers. Um, so I wonder if you just give us your, your insight on how easy or hard it was initially and, and what data sources you, st you wish you would have had um, that you didn't. Sure, I think it would be helpful to answer that with a little bit of context about spatial data in particular. Um, your home address and sometimes even your zip code uh, is considered an identifier under HIPAA. Um, so for privacy reasons, it's very difficult to get that granular spatial data. Um, so that, that's often a challenge with this type of work. And we did have access to the testing data um, that was run by the county sites through Curative and from our health system. And we know that we were missing a lot of testing that was conducted by other community-based partners, um, by the Division of Public Health, by other healthcare systems within Newcastle County. And perhaps some of those sites, they were more connected to a geographic area or a particular population that we were not capturing as well. So I think in, in ideal circumstances, it would have been great to have access to all of the testing data statewide, um, though I can appreciate there are, there are privacy concerns with getting those uh, person level addresses and that type of data sharing can take some time. And we are in the middle of a, a public health crisis where we are trying to get what data we had quickly and uh, turn it around quickly to provide some actionable insights to the county. So I think moving forward, um, as we continue with this type of work, now that we're a little bit out of crisis mode, um, is to think about data sharing opportunities with uh, the Division of Public Health and with other healthcare systems more broadly. Awesome. Um, and what are your thoughts on, so, you know, you initially said that these data came from the county, um, they came from some, you know, funding they had to expand date testing. I wonder if you just sort of have some thoughts, you know, that obviously ended and, and um, I'm not sure actually if we understand the availability of testing now in the community um, or kind of thinking about, about testing as, as we move through the pandemic, how you would approach, you know, looking at what we're doing now to try to make some recommendations on, um, on testing, you know, in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was challenging over the past year to know that the county was was doing everything right in terms of operating test sites across the county, placing them at um, different community locations, advertising them, and trying to be responsive to these data in real time. Um, and unfortunately, there are just so many other barriers to testing access beyond the, the geographic piece, and we saw that consistently. And I think the qualitative piece would be really valuable to hear directly from people about how they can better access these sources or look to other communities that have had more success in reaching um, traditionally hard to reach populations. And perhaps we can do more to bring testing sites directly to people through, through mobile options, really setting up within the neighborhoods where it's needed. Um, and I think of particular examples like the Riverside neighborhood in East Wilmington, um, which had uh, really consistently low testing levels um, relative to the rest of the county throughout the past year. And there were sites in and around that community, um, but it, it just seemed that uh, we had trouble reaching people there with testing. So I would say we need to be hyper-local and reaching uh, specific communities that we see over time um, have not experienced the levels of access that we would like to see relative to the rest of the county. Thanks, Maddie. Any other question, Maddie? So I have a, a question, Mary. Do, do you think that this, uh, this data that you provided would be also helpful for uh, vaccinations? to set up sites, vaccination sites, uh, or has it been used? I think it would be valuable for the provision of vaccination sites, and the county has these data um, to use to inform their strategy. 
And actually, the Division of Public Health has done a great job in this regard of identifying priority communities. Uh, they recently developed maps on their community health dashboard um, that are looking at census tracts or zip codes, I believe, by the percentage of unvaccinated people, as well as the social vulnerability index from the CDC, um, which we used in our social risk score. So they are identifying communities based not only on uh, where vaccination rates are low, but where social vulnerability is high so that they can further pinpoint their efforts. So I think, though, it's a little indirect from this work. Um, they are using the available data and the consideration of social risk to uh, support their vaccination strategies. Great. I have a question. Um, Maddie and team, great work. And all, as always, Maddie, excellent and very clear presentation. Um, you mentioned, I, I can't remember exactly if it was the walk-up sites or which aspect, but you mentioned that folks were, you know, there was a relatively low percentage of folks who were tested at various Wilmington sites who were from Wilmington. And I'm wondering if you have looked at where those folks are coming from. You know, for example, I live uh, right at the border of Ellesmere and Wilmington. And, you know, Ellesmere is not very far from the Latin American Community Center, for example, but is not necessarily Wilmington. So, um, you know, not to add on more work, but I think it would be interesting to look at for, in particular, for some of these um, communities, where are the folks coming from, and particularly the folks who may be of the um, kind of ethnicity or racial ethnic groups that are um, experiencing disparities? I think that could help to um, target and better understand um, maybe how some of the communication flows and also. Um, maybe challenge some assumptions about who are the members of these communities um, more broadly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great idea. And I, yeah, we knew that a little more than half of the people who were tested at, at Kingswood and Latin American Community Center, for example, were coming from outside the city, which seems like a fairly long distance to travel um, for testing. And I think for people who are perhaps more affluent or have work schedules that accommodate testing, it is less of a burden for them to travel further to a test site that is available where they can get tested relatively quickly. Um, but I think that, that hammers home the point that um, for more advantaged populations, the transportation is less of a barrier and we really need to focus hyper-locally on the, the populations that are facing more barriers that we do need to try to reach. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I definitely agree with all of that. I just think that there might be some people who, you know, I know, for example, Ellesmere has a very high kind of um, very, very diverse population, um, you know, and as like, particularly like the cost of living in the city of Wilmington, um, you know, increases. I think people may be near Wilmington, working in Wilmington, but not necessarily living in some of the neighborhoods in Wilmington. Um, so that's just kind of larger point, but thank you so much. This is uh, always interesting to hear. Yeah, thank you, Alicia. Other questions? Well, hearing none, I think we are going to adjourn. Thank you so much, Mali, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, I'm sure we'll learn more about uh, all your work. Thank, Thank you, Claudine. Bye.